Okay, welcome to AP European History with Dr. Brofkin. Today we continue our series of lectures on the French Revolution, uh, one of the most important events in the history of Europe. So just to remind you, in the first installment, we talked about the origins of the French Revolution, the long-term origins, the, the short-term origins, the, uh, the state of uh, French society, the, the philosophes, the ideas, the American debt, uh, which crippled French economy, the attempts of Neckar uh, and Turgot to uh, find a solution, finally, you know, incapacity of Louis uh, to do the decisions. And then the actual uh, beginning of the revolution with the Assemblée Nationale and the storming of the Bastille, uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man, and finally at the March on Versailles. So that's where we stopped, and now let me continue. Uh, so one other thing that's happening parallel to uh, the uh, March of Versailles, which is frustration of the women, uh, mostly women uh, as, as kind of troublemakers, but also of the masses of Paris, or the people of Paris, we could put it like this, uh, is the trouble in the countryside. Uh, and so this period is known in history as the, uh, the, the time of great fear. So if you open up great fear, that would be August, September uh, 1789 in the countryside. So, so what is the fear all about? It's the same kind of fear as it is uh, with the people who storm Bastille. It's a fear of foreign invasion. It's a fear of uh, the Austrians and the Germans, uh, the Prussians coming over and uh, suppressing the revolution. It's also a time of brigands because it's just not enough food. This is the time of, of uh, harvest failures, uh, a second, third year in a row. And of course, there are all these brigands who, you know, basically robbers who take uh, grain, bread, whatever, wherever they ha have. So the, the, the thing I mentioned before is the pattern that is established is that the uh, government does not want to uh, have suppression measures against those who are for the revolution. They have enough enemies of their own. And so they try to stay ahead of the desires of the revolutionary masses, so to speak. So uh, the peasants, uh, the, the government's trying to stay ahead of their wishes to be the leaders. So this was the, the pattern that will actually explain the rise of the Jacobins. Remember, National Assembly tries to be in the leadership role. And this is why they would always try to anticipate what the next thing the revolutionary masses would want and want to do that ahead. So that also explains uh, uh, their action in addition to Declaration of the Rights of Man, in August 89, they uh, passed some very, very important reforms that do actually come across as the French Revolution, such as they abolished the one-tenth, uh, the so-called tith, that the uh, peasants pay to the church. So no more. That medieval re remnant is gone. The peasants are free. They're, of course, very poor. There's no money. Uh, there's failure of harvest, so now they don't have to pay. They also abolished all the privileges of the nobility in terms of hunting, in terms of land use, all kinds of privileges of the nobility over the peasants are gone. That's it. The, peasant, the peasants now are free. Serfdom is gone. Corvée is gone. So essentially, this is the end of the uh, ancien regime in the countryside. The peasants are free. They are no longer under any obligation to the nobles. And, of course, it is a financial hit on the nobles, uh, which Catherine II was afraid to do, which Joseph did, but then got an uprising of nobility against him. And now we have the same situation in France. The revolutionary government does it, but a lot of nobles turn against the revolution, and they would go into immigration, and they would support the foreigners, and it would be a bridge that never be, uh, never be restored in this uh, in this uh, society. Okay, so uh, from that point on, you have uh, a, a relatively peaceful period that stretches through the year 1790. Uh, and 1790 is sort of usually people skip over this period and just move on to the next crisis would be 91. But I want to say a few words about this uh, revolutionary period of 1790. Uh, this is a period where you have uh, a political vitality, uh, where you have all kinds of clubs that are being formed, 
all kinds of pamphlets that are being published, all kinds of associations. There's a buzz of activity. To me, as, as, uh, as a Russia specialist, it reminds very much 1990s in Russia. It, it, sort of the this final uh, year of collapse of the Soviet Union was just everybody was joining political parties, associations, and they were publishing all kinds of pamphlets and reading, 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 discussing, discussing. That, that's what France is like. 1790 is this incredible explosion of uh, political uh, activity. Obviously, there's no censorship. Everything could be published and read. And something that was hidden and passed over secretly, now you could read it and publish and discuss it. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the the cultural atmosphere. Uh, in terms of reforms, one of the most important ones of that period, 1790, is the so-called you have to remember that civil constitution of the clergy, which is the next step uh, in basically disarming, or one could even say further disbanding uh, the Catholic Church as it existed in the NCM regime. You remember it had all kinds of privileges and it had political power and it executed people and harassed people and, and, and barred the Protestants from civil rights and job opportunities. All that is gone. So now uh, everybody is uh, restored to the same status. The Protestants get their political rights. The Jews get their political rights. But more important, the Catholic Church itself is transformed. Uh, and that means that the priests get their salary paid by the states, by the state, by the French state. In other words, they don't get their money from peasants anymore. They are civil servants. They are transformed into a state service system where for their uh, you know, spiritual services to the public, the government is paying them the dues. Uh, also, it is no longer necessary to register your your marriage in the in the like in, in Austria in the church, uh, and you have the kind of a parallel uh, government structure that provides the same sort of services: death registration, birth registration, marriage registration, etc., to the church. But it goes much further than what Joseph did in Austria. It actually disbands the church as an organization. They become subordinate to the state. The only comparable thing that comes to mind is what Peter the Great did in Russia. He basically disbanded the pa patriarch uh, system and created a ministry for church affairs, which was called Synod. Uh, and then the church turned into a state institution. Uh, so this is something that uh, the French Revolution has done. Uh, they also require of the uh, priests to pledge allegiance uh, to the state. And of course, they... Uh, they don't, uh, some of them do, some of them don't. It, it, it leads to all kinds of uh, problems, especially in the conservative provinces. And later on, we, we, one of the reasons for a peasant rebellion in Vendée against uh, the revolutionary government. The Pope uh, contributes, of course, more to it by uh, threatening to excommunicate those who support uh, this new stature, uh, and uh, that leads to even more trouble in the countryside. Uh, monastic, monastic lands seized and sold, something that the uh, atheist writers like Helvetius uh, urged uh, two or three decades earlier. So now the government uh, establishes a source of revenue to help the hungry, and it sells monastery lands and church lands and gets some revenue to, um, to um, distribute to the needy. The next reform of this time is the reorganization of French administrative system, similar to Catherine II uh, in Russia, and, and that still is in effect to the present day. France is divided into département. Uh, it breaks down the province, the old huge provinces, such as Occitanie, which you know is almost like a fifth of France, and Provence and Normandy. Uh, all of those are broken into uh, small departments as they exist today. You could easily look it up on, on uh, a map of France. It consists of tiny, tiny departments uh, that, uh, are, uh, that are self-governing, that they are administrative units, and they are the purpose of that, I think, is to uh, make uniform 
rational government, which becomes the spirit of the French revolutionary government. Uh, and of course, uh, it, it goes further into the calendar we'll talk about later. Uh, so, um, small, and also to break down the uh, local regional allegiances uh, to the people from a certain geographical area, which would have its own dialects, its own commitments, its own autonomy claims, especially in the South, uh, which in the Midi, which was always suspicious of Paris and still is to a present day. So uh, that's what's going on. And, and, and culturally, it's a fantastic period. They created an elephant uh, that was a symbol of freedom for some reason. And they had all kinds of festivities. And they tried to create a kind of a new cult of reason. This is very, very interesting culturally because uh, the French Revolution is trying to replace the Christian symbolism of the, of, of the uh, Christian calendar with new uh, symbols of reason, rationality, uh, and celebrating it as the new form of government. Uh, so that's uh, what they do. Now, economic situation continues to uh, deteriorate. Uh, this is one area where the revolutionary government does not do very well. Uh, and 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 the, the if you look at this, the price rises, you would see that this is uh, getting out of hand. It's like 113 uh, percent, 170 percent. So they really are not managing economy at all, and 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 that leads to radicalization of the people, both in the cities and in the countryside. So there are women, as usually troubles. Uh, uh, riots and marches demanding more bread, demanding cheaper prices, uh, and the uh, government establishes price controls, uh, which of course you know, alienate all those who want to buy and sell and make money on it. So that means that more and more uh, the revolution goes into, uh, into this uh, cycle of more and more repression that soon would be uh, replaced by guillotine and by a radical response to those who disagree. Um, so, the, the crucial moment in this period uh, is June, uh, June 91, 1791, uh, and that is the quite famous, uh, that everybody focuses on that, is the attempt of Louis uh, to flee, to run away. So, uh, let me explain this a little bit. He lives in the... Um, Tuileries Palace, pretty much uh, on the guard, theoretically. Uh, he is um, uh, a king, and there's a constitutional monarchy, and there's a national assembly, and he has to sign all these degrees of the national assembly that he hates. So he really resents his position, that he has virtually no power in reality, but he is forced to play along and to sign. So uh, Antoinette, uh, Marie Antoinette is in secret correspondence with her family in Vienna, and uh, in uh, 91, the, uh, the, the Austrians and the Germans decide to, um, to take the side of the king, and they issue a declaration uh, saying basically that um, uh, that was in August 91, they, they make a declaration that they want to restore monarchical order. But this happens after their attempt to flee, and the attempt to flee basically is like this. He runs away. There were many, many conspiracies. They offered him to fly on a balloon, and they offered him this and that. He chose something that was ruinous. He, uh, the, one of the plans was he would be dressed like a peasant and then escape unnoticed. No, he actually dressed uh, as, as a merchant, but underneath that, that clothes of a merchant, he had a royal outfit. Uh, he kind of hoped that if he is discovered, the people of France loved him. He lived with this kind of a dream world that, that he is the king and the people of France love him. And therefore, when they discover, if they discover that he's trying to run away, he would call the people of France and they would rise up for his defense. He was not entirely wrong, because knowing uh, the politics of France, you see, there were a lot of monarchies still around in the countryside. So he was not totally delusional, thinking that there were people who would support him. But as it turned out, they were not organized in a way that was sufficient to save him. Uh, in any case, um, he uh, he goes to Varennes, which is a, a, a 
but 70 kilometers from the Austrian border, uh, unnoticed. And then in Varenne, what happens is a boy uh, recognized his face because it was on the coins. Uh, and he said, oh, that looks like a king. And they checked out his uh, papers and they were in order. It would look like he was a merchant and stuff like that. But then he actually himself showed his royal uh, clothing, that he is a king, hoping that uh, people would be in reverence to their king. And, and the guy who stood next to him was the postman or whatever. But when it was reported to the authorities, to, this, to the government of Varen, they said, no, 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 wait, we're not going to allow him to flee. So he's, he's turned around and sent back with his wife, of course, with Marie Antoinette and their son. So again, that was stupid because there was another plan proposed to him that he would flee separately and that the wife and children would be sent on a different road, and that way they would be more, uh, have more chances to succeed. In any case, we'll finish up this uh, segment by saying that uh, this is the turning point in the French Revolution. The attempt to flee antagonizes everybody. He loses his power as the constitutional monarch. Now he's going to be treated as a traitor who tried to betray his country to the Austrians. It's a catastrophe for him, and it's a new phase of radicalization we're going to follow uh, after the break. Uh, this is going to be the new phase of the French Revolution. So, thank you at this point, and don't forget to sign up for AP European History with Dr. Brock.